Welcome to Celebrating Act Two. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome back, and uh, thank you for joining us for another uh, interesting conversation. Um, John, who is our special guest today? I have invited an old friend to join us, is Dr. Ed Pruss. He is a dentist, DDS, the official designation after your name. And uh, I wanted Ed to talk about, uh, really, dentistry in the age of COVID-19, because uh, as he knows, I haven't been to the dentist in a long time. But le Ed, let me give, uh, first of all, welcome. Good to see you, Dr. Ed. Nice to see you all. Thank you for joining us. Oh, and also, by the way, I'm going to have to work with John offline. You're not an old friend. I think you're probably a friend of long standing. Oh, no, he gets to he gets to sit down in his dentistry occasionally, you know. OK. <laughs> oh, what a terrible introduction. We're not going to start this again, even though we should. <laughs> Ed, <laughs> Ed, let me give uh, those people who are watching uh, a little bit of background about you. You are a. Um, I don't know what certified dentist you get the DDS after your name. Well, You're a just uh, we we have a dental degree. It's a it's a division of medicine. You know, it's a, yep. we deal with the oral oral component sure. of the uh, digestive tract, and to say the least, it's probably the most important part of the entire digestive system. Uh, well, you know, it is. We can talk about that in a minute. But let me just tell people that you practice. You have your own practice in Hopewell Junction, New York. Right. And as I recall, Hopewell Junction is about 100 miles north of New York City, between the Hudson River and maybe even closer to the Connecticut border. Does that sound about right? We're 11 miles from the Hudson River. Yeah, very nice area. Um, I went gorgeous. to Boy Scout camp up there in Pauling, New York. Yes, there is. Yeah, so I had a great time. Loved the area. Um, I haven't been back in many years. But you practice there in a small town, relatively small town. I imagine that despite the fact that your office is in Hopewell Junction, you really service people from all around, lots of different uh, hamlets and, and towns nearby. Absolutely. The majority do come from local, but I situated myself um, once I left Manhattan, where I spent 29 years of my career in Manhattan, uh, then I just decided that was enough. The commute kept getting longer as we moved farther and farther from the city. And then finally I said, you know, it's time to leave the city. And there were other logistical issues that I was going to have to move my office. So I said, look, let's just leave Manhattan, come up here. And so we came up to Hopewell and I picked the place that sits right near major interstates. So I'm very accessible. It was a, a, a major part of the decision was, in fact, I've got uh, all kinds of interstates all around me, so you can get to me easily. And that, that made it uh, easy to decide. Hopewell is a very nice place. It's a, a smallish town, but it's just one of those many along a uh, thread. You know, it's just like you go into New York City and there are all these tiny towns that you, you know, hopscotch across to uh, get down into Manhattan. And um, so I just decided that uh, I wanted a country practice instead of working as hard as I would. I, I got to commute almost two hours each way, and I said, that's oh, too much. Yeah. So when I had to relocate, I said, I'll relocate up here. And it's, good it's idea. been good. Yeah. It's been good. Good idea. It's a beautiful area. Um, yeah. you, your practice, I imagine, is like... Uh, most dentists across the U.S. Uh, mm. Dentists, I noticed, have not um, have not had the pre the government pressure that doctors have had. Doctors, once upon a time, put out their shingle, might have had a partner, you know, two or three guys. Um, now, doctors, uh, medical doctors, have to be in a group. Um, I know arts doctor is because uh, I w used to be part of that group. There's about thirty or forty of them. My new uh, doctor is part of um, a, a huge, huge uh, uh, medical uh, group called uh, Scripps. Uh, we're in northern San Diego. And, and they own hospitals and they own medical facilities and they must, be, they must have a thousand doctors. Uh, and that's the trend, of course, in medicine. 
But in dentistry, it's not happened. Everybody is still, uh, that I've heard of anyway, is still pretty much a single practitioner. Is that is that relatively true? Well, relatively true. Conglomeration, multi-specialty practices are now becoming more the norm. In fact, the number of dentists that are solo practitioners like myself are getting fewer and fewer, and I would say we're down to 30% of the total. We're never going to be like the hospitals. We're never going to be like the uh, uh, Scripps and the Caremount is what we have up here. They started out when we moved up here uh, to Westchester originally 35 or so years ago. They had 35 doctors. Now they have 500 and about 150 different locations. So we're not going to do that in dentistry, but we will consolidate. And the challenge for the solo practitioner is in being able to compete on the economy of scale size with the uh, larger group practices. Um, I can much imagine. of your success or failure in that reign is really dependent upon your uh, relationship that you create but, with uh, patients. But, uh, but, um, That's uh, very, very critical. But in your particular case, and it's the case of so many uh, in, this, in essence sole practitioners, this is a business that you're not only are you uh, involved in keeping up with everything that's in dentistry and new equipment investments like that, but you're also running a business. Oh, it's you can't, you know, when, when I came out of dental school uh, 47 years ago. 48 years almost now. Um, they, they didn't even teach business. Now, if you don't understand the business side of it, you're just going to shoot yourself. And so, yes, it is very much a business. You have to go through your standard profit and loss and spreadsheets and understand how everything's working. And as per the evolution of cosmetic dentistry back in the 90s, marketing and advertising has suddenly become the norm and it was absolutely frowned upon when we first came out of school so it has very much evolved into a whole different type of uh let, let, let's not to say the word business but a dental practice is now very much more business oriented some uh are too much business oriented so that the business takes over the priority in the mindset of the doctor. And we see that in all aspects of medicine, and it's now in dentistry. So a lot of people are complaining significantly about that fact that they're no longer being felt, feel like they've been being treated like a patient, but they're, they're an entity. And uh, that's becoming a problem. Uh, yeah, I yeah. just read last night uh, an article, and it mentioned basically how you can't even trust um, research papers anymore because everything has marketing behind it. And if you think you're reading an article about the quality of a product, what you're really reading is the manufacturer's opinion about something. And it becomes quite a challenge to differentiate uh, truth from marketing, advertorials, if you will. And I'm under the, I'm right. under the impression that your practice uh, is is kind of a soup to nuts practice, like most uh, local yes. dentists. Yeah, I do. Um, as you do as cosmetic I dentistry. You do, you know, oral surgery. You do teeth <laughs> filling and X-rays and all the standard stuff. You pretty much cover it all. I imagine um, that because uh, I know that's what my dentist does. Um, and, and I'm still, to be real honest, I'm killing myself because I don't know what to do until he opens up again. I, we moved and I put off going to the dentist. It's been a year since I've even had my teeth cleaned and I'm feeling it. I, re I, as you pointed out before, we don't often realize that our oral health, our, the, our teeth 
really affect our whole body, our whole system. Oh, I found that out when so. I got an abscess. Yeah. Extremely so. It's um, It was something I had this fortuitous opportunity. My poor dad, you know, if he pays for your education, well, I guess I got to go to my son instead of my old dentist because that's what I put him into school for. So my father came in and he had terrible gum health. And he also had some problems because he played tennis and he had this um, tendonitis. And once I cleaned his gums up, his tendonitis went away. And I said, gee, that's kind of interesting. Now, this is in the 70s. We didn't know from nothing. But I knew right then and there, there was a connection. And uh, I was very fortunate. I, I, I have a very special relationship with one doctor who is probably... If you uh, uh, tallied every doctor in the world, he is probably known by more doctors than any other person. He's an um, endodontist, a root canal specialist, but he is a phenomenal researcher. And he dragged me into the research side. So I learned from the very beginning what it's really like to be looking at the research as opposed to what people say to you. So I take everything with a huge grain of salt and I create my own conclusions and really run my own direction. I beat my own drum and walk. I'm not your typical dentist. I have a, a question for you. Um, uh, with Everybody seems to know that New York has had a pretty strict lockdown. We've had it here in California. And um, how has that affected uh, your practice? I mean, is it even open? No, no, we're not. And uh, I, as much as it may seem to be a negative, uh, it's not. It's actually given me great opportunity to reevaluate things and to prepare for things. Uh, we used to try to get all these things done while in the middle of a busy work schedule. So I've taken great advantage of this time off. And uh, we're going to be bringing in implants into the office. Last year or a year and a half ago, we bought a 3D x-ray machine. That was done at the urging of my friend, who now heads up the Department of Graduate Endodontics at the University of Pennsylvania and runs their international program. He's, he's quite a big, he's, he's a big cheese. And uh, he, basically has directed my thinking and taught me how to evaluate things and don't be fooled by common opinion because it's more often than not it's a sales talk but you know insofar as COVID is concerned um you know we've got all our ppp loans and idle loans and whatever else is out there so i haven't suffered uh, if you don't get those things, you're in serious trouble, but I'm using the time to prepare and get ready. The hardest thing that we're facing is in the equipment. The equipment procurement is brutally tough because hospitals and medical centers and nursing homes and police and doctors, they get first crack at all this stuff, and then you come back to dentists and we are just low on that totem pole. I got an email from a guy, Stan Rendon. He's at 3M. He runs their global uh, uh, um, security program for pandemics and things like that. And I've been communicating with him since March, trying to find stuff back then because I knew 3M made the masks. I still cannot get my hands on that mask. It's next to impossible and relevant to the crisis, what frightens me the most is I got a pack of, ma of masks and they were all frauds. They're all counterfeits. And I've heard this story now multiple times. So I'm very concerned when we open up, since we are in an environment where we are going to be creating a bacterial or viral aerosol, how is that going to be handled? So we, in our family, we're extremely cautious about that stuff. So we really put our heads together. And I have come up with some ideas. And today, 
I'm going to continue searching out. I am going to try to get that device that you see doctors wearing with the pipe out the back with the battery pack. It's, a, it's called a papper machine and it blows air into the mask. Uh, one of the other challenges for doctors coming out of COVID and opening their practice, if they are working with a true N95 mask, it is hot because yeah, your yeah. breath is sealed inside the mask and sure, your breath sure. has got to be what, 90 degrees? Yeah. So yeah. it's going to be a physical challenge and I that that's what we've been battling with trying to find it um, how am I going to deal with it what clothing are you going to wear uh, how often the cost of it all will be quite significant how often are you going to change the garments you know to what degree does a COVID particle drop off an outer garment and, and get down onto something or someone. We're gonna put drapes on patients. Patients are gonna have glasses. We're gonna wear hair nets, foot booties, everything. It's going to be so different. That then says, well, how much dentistry are you gonna get done in a day? That's the problem. Cleaning out a room. How, how are you cleaning up that room? It, it, that's gonna take time. Who's gonna do that? You may have to hire a new staff. Well, there's another expense. On and on and on. It just never stops. It's going to be a tremendous challenge for dentistry. Tremendous challenge. Uh, Dr. And, Dr. People, people often, often forget, forget or forget just or don't even think about the fact about that, that dentists, dentists are working so more closely, closely to us as a patient right. than, than, than most of the doctors <laughs> outside of surgery. If you look at the Cuomo's charts, um, he puts the infectiousness of a profile, you know, of an industry or a, of a business on his chart, and we sit at the very top corner along with nursing homes. We're, we're in the worst of environments. And what bothers me is I've been, oh my gosh, Susie and I have spent maybe 500 hours more probably in trying to find things, and I sent maybe eight or nine letters to Cuomo, to my representatives, to everybody, senators, telling them about all these problems, about the fact that we do not have proper equipment. And I am pretty concerned about that because, yeah, I'm going to take care of myself and I'm gonna make sure it's right for me. I won't even open up if I don't have it. I will stay closed until I get protection. I have two staff members that have comorbidities, which means they have other factors in their in their bodies that make them very vulnerable to the virus. And so I can't open up until I know we've got everything we need to have. What about a young doctor that hasn't quite figured out how to think it through? What if he's being told by his overseeing uh, 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 owner of the practice, there are places like Aspen Dental, Countrywide Dental, where there may be a hundred doctors. And they say, this is what you got to do. And I wonder how well they're going to attend to the viral protection. That's, that's what's got me worried. When you look at the large group practices, because they're not thinking like medical doctors. They're looking for shortcuts quick. Let's make the buck. Let's get it done in and out. Um, I see this all the time. I see a lot of my patients come out of those kinds of practices. Then they come to me. You know, I'm old school. I do things the way it was always done long before any of these problems. Uh, I built my whole reputation on that kind of a profile, so I'm not about to change it. But I worry about the younger doctors that don't have fastidious uh, uh, head uh, 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 dentists in their practices. That, that has me concerned. Uh, so what do we as patients have to look for when we go back to our dentist? Well, that's a very good question. I, I, I would, um, <clears throat> I would be walking into a practice with the eyes wide open. I'd be looking at how are there other are patients in the waiting room, for instance. Now, if it's an Aspen Dental, there will be. How closely are they sitting apart? It gives you an immediate sense as to how 
closely, they're going to uh, adhere to the distancing, the physical distancing issues. Uh, are patients wearing masks in the waiting room if they are in the waiting room? When you see the staff, uh, will they have a plastic barrier between them and anybody walking in and out of the practice? If you don't see these things, I would start to get concerned because then they're not treating it seriously enough. If the doctor is wearing a standard surgical mask and you see on the side of the mask, a standard surgical has a big gap here. That's a bad sign because that allows the aerosol to get in. And uh, we had one doctor just before we were closed down in March and I did a quick estimate. He had three practices, three practice locations, which is a testimony to that idea that you ask, is it happening in dentistry? Yeah, a lot of doctors have two and three locations now. Not that unusual, but a lot of them do. And I estimated that he saw, he, he didn't know it, he was COVID positive, And he saw at a minimum in his practice, 500 people, one one guy. So that's, that, that's gonna be quite a trick. And patients need to be looking to make sure that they're going to a place where they're paying attention to this. And if they don't, you have every right, since it's your mouth, your money, your health, to say, hey, doctor, where's your, where's your uh, N95 mask? I don't like what I see here. And you could just as easily get up and leave. By the way, I, the way, I, 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 I want I, I, to applaud you. Uh, I went for my first uh, uh, annual checkup just a week ago, and uh, the, the office that John was alluding to before. And uh, when I walked in, first of all, I walked into the building. My somebody put a, a thermometer to my brain, and mm -hmm. uh, found there was nothing there, of course. So, but John's known that for years. Yeah, that's the that's the first thing you right. gotta have a thermometer. And then we go to uh, I go into the waiting room. And uh, every other chair is turned around, and there's a sign on it saying, this is for the protection of our patients. Uh, and they had space in between all the things. There was somebody who normally is a reception person who was wiping down various things with Lysol wipes. Yeah, these and, are the things you want to be looking for. Right. That's, and, what, that's what you're looking for. And everybody that once I went into uh, the offices, uh, everything was clean and fresh. And uh, everybody was wearing a mask. And I, did, I know they weren't N95s because I had those are those white uh, uh, things generally that say N95 on and sitting in yeah. your face with a clip. But they were wearing it's surgical masks. Get them very hard. Right. And uh, yeah. I feel yeah. very comfortable. How many, doctors in, how many doctors in that practice? Uh, probably on that floor, there must be at least four on that. Every floor has at least four practitioners. And some of them multiple where... Uh, there's one one day, one another day, because they probably go to various offices that they have. So, they so 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 uh, within the one practice that you went to, uh, is it a one doctor practice or a multi doctor? Uh, well, my I have a I go to the same one, but there are maybe four GPs on that floor. Four, okay. So that 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 then you get into that. See, our, uh, John, when you talk about you know where is dentistry going as a business, there's a perfect example of how dentistry is evolving, um, trying to develop economy of scale. My, my position as a solo practitioner is rare, um, but I grew up pushing the envelope higher and higher, and it's very hard to find uh, people I want working on my patients. It's, it's, it's a challenge because it's all about speed, efficiency, money, and um, the whole psychology of dentistry back then was to be the better than the guy next to you and that's that's not really the case anymore it's, it's changed quite a bit uh going back on um patients uh and covid um <clears throat> what we're going to have patients do is first of all they have in new york they have to be tested we will not allow somebody in that has not gone because you can get testing now finally uh, that was a big mistake to not test everybody in the beginning, but we know that. And 
So you have to be tested, then they're going to get the thermometer, and then we have also the um, uh, pulse oximeter that tells us the blood saturation. The um, interesting thing about COVID is that the symptoms in the beginning are so innocuous and like you think nothing of it and it's i don't smell as well i don't taste as well um, you lose some of your senses and that's one of the very first signs and then the next thing that starts to happen is you start to see a drop on the oxygen saturation in the blood they are basically now starting to call COVID not a respiratory disease. I was watching several episodes of this one channel on uh, YouTube. He has his own channel now. Uh, and we were going through all the chemistry, the biochemistry of COVID. In fact, it's really a blood circulatory disease and it affects your lungs, but it's a circulatory disease. And um, it's amazing how it damages your blood vessels. And because the blood vessels aren't working right, well, then your air can't transport between the lungs, the little sacs in the lungs, and your blood vessels. And therefore, you feel like you can't get enough air to your body because there's edema right in that little space between the little alveolar sac and the blood vessel. And that, that, and that has the lining, it's called endothelial lining, and it gets edema in there plus other chemistries, and it doesn't transport the oxygen across, therefore you think you can't breathe, and therefore you get on a ventilator, et cetera, et cetera. When in fact, it's, um, uh, uh, it's more primed by circulation. And the interesting thing, and I saw this last night, um, most important things for a patient to do I think it should be across the board is take vitamin D, make sure you have proper doses of vitamin D. It is a critical factor in the blood circulatory uh, resistance to those. You know, when you often hear the phrase an antioxidant, you know, your body sure, has sure. is doing oxidation and you get these uh, oxygen molecules with an extra electron. So these antioxidants, well, Vitamin D plays a role in preventing antioxidants. And then last night, I'm going to check with my physician on this one. He came up with a, a thing that's called NAC. And it's extremely important in keeping the body healthy and preventing the symptoms if you get COVID to keep it from getting to be bad. So NAC um, is an n acetyl uh, uh, cysteine uh, is a very important component and I'm, I'm going to in my next uh, email that I send out to my patients I'm going to mention that to them it's a talk to your physician see if they think it's appropriate for you and do that um, I'm all my mentality is all about prevention you know go back to your situation John um, if you haven't been to your dentist in a while you can keep everything at bay in a very easy way, and it's kind of crazy, but uh, when I first came out of dental school, this guy gave a lecture, and I said, gee, that's kind of an interesting tool, and he was talking about a toothpick, and we know all about toothpicks, but we don't know of it as an actual cleaning device, and that's if you go in there and you dig around, you're emulating what the hygienist does, but you just don't get the sharp edge but you can keep the bacterial count way down. Then if you change the uh, oral chemistry a little bit by rinsing out with a, a alkaline, the bacteria like acid. So rinse out occasionally with baking soda. You know, simple things like that are very, very powerful tools against bat gun disease. I'm writing that down. Oh, I thought you were gonna use a pencil. Yeah, not, don't use a lead pencil, please. No. <laughs> But uh, we actually have a, a, a device called a perioid, and it we, we we searched around and we found those Oriental style toothpicks that are a little bit uh, off in one end, and they're harder, 
standard toothpicks get soft very quickly. So we searched around, found these, and we get them out of our Chinese food store. And <laughs> you stick it in at both ends, and you just go and dig away at your gums. And I, I'll tell you, your hygienist will be stunned when she sees you and say, what have you been doing? So, so, I've, been picking my, I've been picking my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the answer to oral hygiene is really is going to have more Chinese, more chop suey, more yeah, egg rolls. Chop suey, and don't and, forget to bring it and get a toothpick from the, uh, from the little bowl, right? <laughs> well, I'm going to ask for them instead of fortune cookies the next time. I <laughs> yeah, get. that's right. Yeah, fortune cookies got too much salt and sugar. John, John, <laughs> John I'm glad you you knew this guy. Oh who, man! Who knew that you knew some really smart people? I, I thought I, I was the only one. Who listen? When I knew him, he wasn't that smart. No. <laughs> I was in the dental school. I'll tell. Let me let me tell you how. Let me tell you how effective this is. A lot of people gum disease. Oh, you got to see the periodontist, the gum specialist. I have where we live. We have a lot of people that just either don't know weren't told, and I blame the dentist for the most part, but then you blame the patient for, well, why didn't you say or do something about it? Nonetheless, they are they come into my office, and many people will say, oh, they want to pull out all my teeth. And I said, just hold on a second. And I'll look at the whole situation. And in 16 years, and this started with the New York City patient, and in 16 years, I have never sent a patient to a gum specialist no matter how badly they walk into my practice and they come in with gargantuan dip pockets between their teeth and all this stuff. And it's just because we are teaching them how to fish. We teach them how to get in there every day and clean. And it is so effective that it would totally change dentistry if everybody got on that, if you will, got on the stick. We use other devices. The toothpick is what, just one device, but uh, there are special devices that we use that came out of Australia, and they can clean any spot in the mouth. And when you do that, there are no bugs. And when there are no bugs, what happens? Heals. You're healthy, yeah. And then the body just starts its process of rebuilding itself. And um, that's what we've been doing for 16 years. And I bet there isn't a dentist in the country that can say they've done it for 16 years that way. And uh, that's why we're going to get into doing our own implants and things like that, because I think we can control our environment better. I think we can do a better job. Well, in this day and age, that's maybe the most important thing, at least as a baseline. Ed, thank you so much for all of this. This has been great information. Yeah. Um, I want to let people know how to get in touch with you. You have a website? <clears throat> yeah, we... Um... Dr. Prus, D R P R U S D D S dot com. You can find me just e most easily if you just say, uh, type in the Google Edward Pruss and say uh, Dutchess County, New York, or uh, you know, uh, New York, Edward Pruss. There aren't too many with my name. That's fortunately, I'm not a John Smith. And then I'll pop up in Google. And uh, we always rank at the top of the page. We have, we have a lot of, it, it's, it's kind of a wonderful thing that if you don't come to my practice because you were referred by a patient, 99.99% .99 of our patients come because of our Google reviews. And that is, that's a pretty amazing statement. The people will go and read various people, then they say, no, your reviews. And that's what we work hard on. We get people to, you know, we treat them the right way, and, and we, we, we get the referrals on the basis of that. It's quite an interesting world out there now because uh, in this day and age, we don't know what we're going to face when people come back. You know, what are their attitudes going to be? It will be safe to go to a dentist. That's one thing I can tell you. What's it going to be like in the general term of dentistry? As soon as we get our act together and the equipment is all there, the dental office will be terribly safe. Very good place to go. Uh, uh, back in the days of the HIV crisis, uh, it, no, nobody, there was no transmission back or forth. I, mean, I was in Manhattan. I mean, it was HIV central. You know, yeah, we had yeah. all kinds of patients. A lot of them died. 
but there was no cross-contamination. And the same thing will happen here. Dentists are pretty fastidious when, when they have to be. They'll, 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 they'll knuckle down and do, do a good job. And um, they won't be, you know, they don't have to be afraid of going to the dentist or catching the disease. That'll be highly unlikely. There are several ways to do it, and it's not worth going into because it gets complex. But we're going to li literally trap the aerosol through a suction device, like, like a vacuum cleaner. And um, uh, we're going to just put it near the mouth, and everything's going to go into that through special filters. But there are many different ways to do that. And um, so d dentistry, per se, as, as, as a place to go get treatment done, that'll be easy. Uh, I'm going to be working with rubber dams and things like that. You know, every doctor's going to have his own preference. We all have our own style. Well, that's good information. And now I know I don't have to rely on toothpicks for my oral health. <laughs> I, was I can actually go back and see my dentist. I was going to get you a, uh, a special collection of toothpicks for your birthday, but uh, Dr. Ed has ruined the surprise. <laughs> uh, but one thing I would like to do, this was fascinating. And uh, hopefully we, we would... We just thought it would be a great conversation, which it has been. But I wonder whether or not we might be able to come back in a month or so after you've reopened your practice and get some sense of how it's going for you, which could would probably mirror a lot of other uh, dental practices reopening, and also reactions that you get from your patients. When they yeah, that, come that's going to be interesting to see how they how they feel about it. Um, we won't be opening up, my guess is, till the third or fourth week in June. I don't think, I think that's how, because Cuomo, it, what, what's interesting, I look at this um, site called MedCram, and he does the charts in the front end all the time. And if you take New York State out of the national equation, the incidence of COVID is still on the rise. If you look at New York State, it is the only one that I have seen, including California, Texas, Florida, a lot of them. It is the only state that has a steep downward curve after we reach our peak. And that's because Cuomo has been so fastidious and so intense. Um, he, he has really, really cracked the whip on everybody. And as a result, if you look at it, it goes up and it comes right back down again, as opposed to California and the states, the United States as a general, they're all straight across and they're not really coming down to any great degree. Uh, internationally, Australia, New Zealand, they just went up and then immediately dropped down. They did the intense closure. That's what Cuomo did. So it will be interesting to see what happens. I'm a little concerned when I see things out in Missouri and see all the parties, nobody's wearing masks. Um, somehow, I think in New York, we're going to be safe, but I worry about the country as a whole. I think there might be some problems. And then, of course, the, what do they talk about? The, the, the uh, come back in um, the fall. Yeah, you know, yeah. I worry about schools. Sure. sure. Schools, boy. Yeah. You know, a doctor was on... NPR, he was the head of Michigan Dental School. And that's another issue. Glad, glad I thought of this one. If you are in an office, if your doctor has an office and the rooms are not separate rooms, isolated, and all the aerosol can travel above the partitions, room to room, uh, bay to bay to bay, that's a dangerous situation. That is, wow. that's what the doctor at the University of Michigan Dental School said. We have 1,000 patients a day as a rule, and they're all open. And what's, what are they going to do? I don't know. He's very concerned. And that, that's, that's a significant uh, physical uh, thing to be aware of. Now, it doesn't mean that there will be issues but it adds to the possibility that transmission can jump from uh, uh, treatment bay to treatment bay. Yeah. So that's, that's, it's an interesting problem, and you know it's it's going to be it's going to be something we all have to deal with. You know. 
Well, we'll come back uh, in a few uh, few weeks. Yeah, sometime or... July would be a good time because by then we're, we're going to be open and things will be have moved along a little bit. In June, it'll be just barely. You know, we're going to be still finding a way, but July July would be a good time to revisit this whole thing and see what's happening. Good. Well, Nobody we'll... knows. Nobody knows. Yeah. Ed, thank, Ed, you, thank so you so very, very much. much. My pleasure. I'm glad you were smart enough to invite me. <laughs> <laughs> I get smarter. Even though as we're old again. friends, friends of long standing. Oh, I was I was smart enough to let Don invite you. <clears throat> so it was and, it was great great talking to you. Thank you, and I right. hope uh, to your listeners. I hope this provided some sanguine and good information that they can use when they go see their dentists very important i think so yeah right. good so in in uh, to all the folks who are watching thank you for watching and uh, check ed uh, pruss's dentistry website out at dr p-r-u-s d-d-s.com good and i know that there's some you've put some articles up there and some papers and there's some good reading it's not just uh, yeah, we're, how we're to contact totally you revising it because it's um i i when i when i did it i i wanted to inform and i found out no you don't do that on a website so we're going to, we're in the process right now with my son we're totally revamping it but the information is still going to be there um I had I would have thought that in six to eight weeks I could have gotten to my book. I, I wrote a book when I was commuting from New York to Washington, in New York to uh, uh, out here in Hopewell. I said, "Well, what am I going to do with the time?" So I wrote a book for consumers, and uh, it's still sitting on the typewriter. It has not been published yet. In fact, John and I are gently working on it, trying to move it forward. So we'll see. Good. We'll see. Good. Okay. All right, guys, it was a wonderful time talking with you. Thank you so All much right. for having me. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.